I just want to say welcome to Southport Heights Christian Church, and I just want to thank you for spending part of your Easter with us today. So whether you're joining us right here in the worship center or you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. I got to share, though. I know there are some sitting here today, whether you are here in the sanctuary or you're online, and you came through those doors with your heels dug in. Am I right? Come on, let's be, it's, it's Sunday and it's also Easter. We got to tell the truth today. Let me deal with it. Some of you are here today out of obligation. I get that. I watch HGTV with my wife, right? Hey, honey, let's watch The Notebook. No guy ever said. <laughs> Some of you are here today because you made a trade-off. Because you knew if you didn't come to church today, your spouse or your mother or your significant other is going to let you hear about it all week. So you decided one hour is better than a week's worth of whining. But let me give you some full disclosure. I don't think that anyone here is accidentally. I don't think anyone here is incidentally. I think there is something about the story of Jesus that draws people to it, even though we can't explain it. it has been that way since Jesus first showed up in history. So what do we know this morning? We know no one disputes if Jesus was a real person who changed our world. No one disputes that. No credible historian has ever debated that Jesus was a real person who lived or changed our world. That's why we have Easter Sunday 2023. Why does the world keep track of time based on a system of B.C. and A.D.? It stands before Christ and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. The whole world keeps track of time based on the birth of one single person, Jesus. He literally changed how we mark time. Folks, that's indisputable. The only thing open for debate today, can Jesus change your world? I'll tell you what, the leadership here at SHCC, uh, we believe he can. As a matter of fact, we believe that he is just dying to change your world. He is just waiting for some of you today to come home. Here's what I want to talk about today at this Easter. If it's true that Jesus wants to change your world and welcome you home, why is it that so many people hesitate and so many hold off trusting Jesus as their Savior? Why is that? We'll talk about one big reason today, but before we talk about that, I want to show you a picture. A picture that some researchers have used to describe a uniquely human phenomenon. Now, when you see this picture, you will have one job, right? One job. And that is to find a toothbrush in this messy bathroom. Anybody find that messy toothbrush in that bathroom? Raise your hand if you see that toothbrush in that messy bathroom. Which one did you see? The little one on the front of the counter? How about the big black one on the back of the counter? Uh-huh. Didn't see it, did you, until I said something? That's, that's it. We don't see that. It's huge. It's ginormous. How many of you saw that right off the bat? Now, remember, it's Easter. It's Sunday. You better be telling the truth. <laughs> Why do we miss something so big and so obvious? Well, researchers have been studying this in depth for the, over the past 30 years. And they describe this universal human tendency to miss 
obvious things as this. They call it inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness, and that is the surprising failure to notice something so obvious. I mean, something that's right in front of you. And there are a couple reasons that they propose this. They said, number one, because it's bigger than our expectations. We didn't expect to see a toothbrush seven feet long, did we? But there it was. It's just the way it is. It was bigger than we imagined a toothbrush should be. Secondly, is our attention becomes focused on something else. As soon as you saw the little toothbrush, you stopped looking. Agreed? That's just the way it is. That's what happens. We locked in on it, and that's where we stopped. And I want to suggest to you today that many, <clears throat> many of us have inattentional blindness when it comes to Jesus for the same two reasons. Who he was and what he did was way bigger than anyone could ever imagine. And two, so many around Jesus were focusing on the wrong things. In fact, I think I can make a very strong case that the very original followers of Jesus had inattentional blindness. I'm going to show you something. Let's watch and see how completely blind the disciples were to how big what Jesus was doing and how they focused on the wrong things. We're going to look at three passages right now, all from the book of Matthew. First one's in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Matthew 17, verse 22. After they gathered again in Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies, and he will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. And then again, Matthew chapter 20. Listen, I love, he's like a teacher, he said it twice and now he's getting a little frustrated. Listen to me, right? Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law and they will sentence him to die. And they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip and crucified, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. Now I, wanna, I want you to think about something. You look at those three passages could it have been any more obvious about what was going to happen to Jesus? But here's the thing. After Jesus was killed and laid in that tomb on Friday, do you know how many of Jesus' followers expected him to be raised from the dead? That would be a goose egg. Zero. Nada. Zilch. I mean, not one single follower of Jesus was standing outside the tomb early on Sunday morning, and they're holding hands and they're saying, okay, let's count down together. Ten, nine. They weren't there. They weren't doing that. Nobody did. They were holed up in an upstairs hideout, hoping that they wouldn't be the next to be nailed to a Roman cross. In fact, with some of them, some of the female followers of Jesus went to the tomb on Sunday it wasn't because they thought that he was going to be raised from the dead listen because it was because the body of Jesus was taken down from the cross so quickly and wrapped so hastily by a couple of guys that they thought the men didn't do it right and so they went on Sunday morning the day after the Sabbath to make sure it was done right sounds about right doesn't it yeah, I do something around the house. Guess who follows me to make sure it's better? It works. But when they saw the empty tomb, they ran back to tell the disciples who were hiding that Jesus' body was missing from the grave. And not one of the disciples said to the ladies, well, of course he isn't there, silly. Did not our Lord tell us he had to suffer and die and be raised again? Duh. Nobody said that. Not even after eyewitness testimony to an empty tomb, they still didn't believe. And then I love this, when, when Jesus later, he appeared to him and he came back from the dead, he was there, he was standing in their midst, and they thought he was a ghost. He's right there, right in front of them. 
Why did they miss it? For the same two reasons it's happening to many people today. The two big reasons that many people miss the message of Easter is number one, God's unconditional love is so big, it goes beyond our wildest dreams. Think about it. Almost all of the love that we experience in this world is conditional. It comes with conditions. And when we give love, we expect to receive love back. When we withhold love, we know what's going to happen to that relationship. It's in trouble. Happens in friendships. Happens in families. Happens in marriages. Can you think of someone that you used to be good friends with? Or some family member that you were close to? Or someone maybe that you were married to? What happened? What happened? What happened is that somebody probably crossed a line that should not have been crossed and they just did it too many times. And the relationship ended. Do you know who has a good understanding of what conditional love looks like? It's all you cat lovers out there. I'm telling you. I want to share a picture that I found. I'm not saying your cat doesn't care about you. I'm just saying if Lassie was a cat, Timmy would still be in the well. <laughs> How true is that? Now, for those of you, you young people out there who don't know who Lassie is, you don't know who Timmy is, Google it. Get an education. And we laugh. But all of us know that the love that we experience in our relationship is conditional. That's why it's so hard to imagine a God who has complete and total unconditional love. Let me tell you, it's even bigger than that, though. It's bigger than that. Because God's love is so big that he don't just love us unconditionally. He loves you. He loves me counter-conditionally. He loves me in spite of my condition. That's what Paul tried to convey to the early followers in the church in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. He said this, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Listen, folks, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God is not mad at you. God is mad about you. And he wants you to come home. And for some of us today, that is just so big. Go so far beyond our wildest expectations and our past experiences, and we miss it. Here's the second reason. Our attention gets focused on everything else but God. Researchers of in the inattentional blindness tell us that our field of focus is actually pretty narrow. And what they mean is that we're able to truly have laser-like focus on something about as wide as your thumb. Meaning the more we get away from that very small zone, then things become out of focus. They become unclear. Now, there are things going on over here, and there's things going on over here. But I'm not really able to pay attention to what's here, if I'm seeing here. And honestly, many of us have relegated God to our periphery of our overloaded, severely stressed out lives. And what are we focusing on instead? Hmm. Making money? We pour our lives into our jobs and careers thinking that that's going to satisfy us? For some of us, we focus on pleasure. We're focused on the next adventure, the next trip, the next cruise, the next whatever. 
or some of us pour our lives into a hobby or a sport and we think that our team's success will satisfy us for at least a season, except in Indianapolis. But that's the point. You see, the season of all these things comes to an end. It doesn't last. I love the honesty of this verse that's found in Hebrews 11.25. It's talking about Moses, and it says, He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, the writer in Hebrews, he's clear about two things right here. There is pleasure in sin. And if you didn't find pleasure in sin, then you were probably doing it wrong. The second is, it only lasts for a season. Money runs out, friends go away, trip comes to an end, pleasure fades. And we start to wonder why we're empty inside. We're empty inside because we put God to the side. And then March 2020, something happened. The pandemic hits. And what that did was to expose all the false hopes that we put things in that can't satisfy us, that can't save us, they can't secure us. Let me be honest, that's why some of you are here today, I hope. Because you're realizing that you're missing something in life. And I'm just going to tell you, what you're missing is God. And you need to move him from the periphery of your life to the center of your life. And to begin to build your life on something more permanent, something more lasting, something that you can fully trust and count on. I believe that's why God has some of you here today. To welcome you home. For those of us who've been here a while, been around Jesus a while, you know what? I think he's doing the same with us. I think he's asking us today to come home. And by that, I mean he wants us to be fully devoted followers of him. Go all in following Jesus. To do that, I think of a door. I think of a door. Did you know that Jesus once described himself as a door through which people came to meet God? I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear. But after that, he also warned people about trying to go through other doors to get to God. So I just want to mention three of those other doors this morning. Number one, the wrong door. You ever gone through the wrong door? Who likes to eat at Cracker Barrel? If your hair is white, I know you do. <laughs> love Cracker Barrel. I love Cracker Barrel. I've been eating Cracker Barrel for years. We're on vacation. I'll eat at Cracker Barrel. I travel around, I eat a Cracker Barrel. What's unique about Cracker Barrel? You walk through the front doors, and what do you see? Besides trouble. You see the little store, the gift shop, right? And if you walk through the gift shop, what's at the back of the store? The bathrooms. And every Cracker Barrel that I've ever been in was always the same. You go through the store, you get to the bathrooms, men on the right, women on the left. They're not all that way. <laughs> I was at Cracker Barrel in Lexington, Kentucky years ago. And I'm standing there using the facility. And a woman walks right behind me. Now, I'm not going to say who went in the wrong door, but somebody did. The wrong door. So I guess they're not all set up quite the same, are they? Some of you have gone through the wrong door. Let me tell you what the wrong door is. The wrong door is trying to find fulfillment in anything or anyone outside of the risen Jesus Christ. It's the wrong door. In the words of the great country theologian, Johnny Lee, you've been looking for love in all the wrong places. 
I heard about a, bird, a team of bird researchers that placed 100 wooden decoys on the Aizu Island of Japan. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to encourage endangered albatross to stay there and to breed. However, for more than two years, the researchers had an albatross that was named Deco that tried to woo a wooden decoy by building fancy nests and fighting off the rival suitors. He spent his day faithfully by the side of a fake bird. You could say that Deco was duped by a decoy. And yet, how many of us are drawn to a decoy of desire or allured by an illusion of fulfillment or blinded by the bait of the empty promises or the permanence in a world that's passing away? That's what a follower of Jesus, his name was John. This is what he said in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, come, it comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. It's the only door. Don't go through the wrong door. Don't put anything in your life ahead of the guy that came back to life after three days. That's the wrong door. Hey, there's a second door. It's the locked door. The locked door. What's the locked door? Well, the locked door is thinking that the key to being good with God is because of my good works. Listen, some of you think this morning that being a good Christian is just trying to be a good person. That's all we need to do. And try to make sure that we do more good things than we do bad things. You know, if you ask most people why they think they're going to go to heaven, they'll say things like, well, I always try to, or I always do my best. In other words, it's based on our attempt to live a good life. Why? Because most of us believe that good people go to heaven. Most of us believe that good people go to heaven. But here's a very important question. How good's good enough? And how would you ever know if you're good enough? Since none of us are perfect, what's the available, what's the ratio we use? 80-20? 70-30? I'm sure hoping 51-49. Right? What, what's, it, what's it take? I, I like an illustration I've, I've seen a long ago, and I've used it many times. But I love this. What would happen if you became good enough that you only sinned three times a day? The words you say, the thoughts you think, the deeds you do, three sins a day. Now, for some of you, that would be a massive improvement. Right? You might even be unrecognizable to people who are even closest to you. But think about this for a moment. Three times a day. That's 1,095 sins a year. Run those numbers out for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years. Listen, can you imagine standing in front of a judge with nearly 1,100 traffic violations and trying to convince him that you're a good driver? Where would that go? Here, here's what we need to listen to. Listen, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Goodness is not the key to being good with God. And I'm just going to say amen and thank God for that. That's good news. Jesus, listen, Jesus came and took the blame for everything that we've ever done, the things we've done wrong, that is, and then he gives us credit for everything we've done right. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not reckoning unto them their trespasses. Wow. He runs to reconcile. He doesn't hold against us our sin. That's the locked door. There's one more door that prevents people from coming back to 
God from coming home. And that is the slammed door. The slammed door is thinking that God is ashamed of you and won't accept you because of your past. A lot of us here today, I'll, I'll tell you, we got shame and guilt for things that we did in our past, or maybe it's for things that were done to us. You know, those things that we said we'd never do again, and two days later, we did it. There are things we've never told anyone about. And we walk around, and we try to push it down, and we push it down. It's like pushing a beach ball underwater. You push it down, what happens eventually? It pops up and hits you in the face. That's what happens. When we try to push it down, it pops up. And we're afraid that God's going to slam the door because of what we've done. And this is one of the greatest lies that Satan has put on this earth. He wants you to believe that shame should keep you from God. But for those of you who are here over the past series that we did, the prodigal series that we just completed... It's based on the greatest story that Jesus ever told. It's about a father and his two sons. And we have a God who will not, not only slam the door and only welcome you back home, but he runs to reconcile you. He is fast to forgive you. There is no slamming door with God. There's only an open door that he invites you to walk through and open arms that he invites you to walk into. I love this quote. Most of you know that by now that I love to read Tim Keller. He said this, To be loved but not known is comforting, but it's superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. You know, I think uh, today, I believe today, it's time for many, many of us to come home to the love of God. Just a few weeks after the resurrection of Jesus, a large crowd of people gathered around the temple, and there was this outspoken guy named Pete who stood up, and he boldly told them what they had done and what he had witnessed, and that Jesus had suffered and he died on the Roman cross for their sins, and then he told them, that he was raised to life. Here's one of my favorite verses about the resurrection. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. One of my favorite verses. I like the other, another translation that says, death was no match for him. And people were so convicted by his words, they asked, okay, to the apostle, what do we do? What do we do? Peter again speaks up, leave it to Pete. He's not gonna let it go. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Could anything be simpler or more straightforward? But just in case, let me be even more clear. This is what he said. Believe in Jesus. He's the door. Repent of your sins because he's the only one who can solve your sin problem. Repent doesn't mean just to feel bad about what you've done, but to start to follow Jesus from this point on. And thirdly, be baptized. I think that's about as simple and clear as it gets. <laughs> Do you know what's crazy about this? In that short little verse in, in Acts 2, 4, uh, 238, when Peter said that, look at this, in 241, people did this. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Maybe today's your day. You see, nowhere in the Bible does it say tomorrow is the day of salvation. It says today is the day of salvation. Today, you may have the opportunity to come home. Now, I know that some of you, your heart is beating a little faster right now. And I know that you've tried the wrong door and you've tried the locked door and you still have this fear of the slammed door. Today is the day to try the open door. 
The one where the Father will come running to reconcile and where you will be forgiven very fast. Some of you have thought about baptism, but there's this thing that comes up in your mind and all these little excuses begin to build, don't they? Like, I've not had a baptism class yet. Hey, you just had it. That's what this sermon was. You've already had your baptism class. See, all you need to know is that Jesus is the only one who can solve your sin problem. That we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday because that's exactly what he did. He rose on the third day. And that you're committing to follow him from this day forward. But this morning when I got up, I wasn't planning on doing this. You know, when those 3,000 people got up on that day of Pentecost, I don't think they were planning either. But they went. I didn't bring a change of clothes. Well, let me tell you what, we've got t-shirts. We've not even had a chance to use them yet. But we've got t-shirts and robes. We can make that happen, okay? We've got plenty of towels so you can dry off. I had somebody tell me one time they were afraid of water. I said, in my 40 years of baptizing people, I have never yet seen somebody drown. Not even when I hold them under until the bubbles stop. <laughs> I'm afraid my hair and my makeup will be a mess after getting wet. Well, we actually have free makeup kits today, so you don't have to worry about that. That's a lie. <laughs> but I do have a scientific fact for you. If you're ready for it. People who get wet eventually dry off 100% of the time. I know there are some of you this morning that need to make the decision. Maybe you need to start with a conversation about who Jesus is, but there are some of you that I know are ready to be baptized. You just haven't stepped out to do it. Today's the day. Today's the day of salvation. There's something that we say anytime that we baptize someone. And I'm going to ask that we all stand right now. Because I believe not only are those who need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior need to say this, I think those of us who've been here for decades need to say it. Because it needs to be fresh in our minds all the time. And you know what it is. Give it to him, David. I believe. One more time. I believe. And amen and amen.